Hello and welcome today from snowy North Germany and sunny Southern California. We're going to have a very odd combination today for you guys. I am the host here at the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Soul War, Niels Eichhorn. And today I am joined by Christina Davidson. She is a professor of Caribbean and African diaspora history at the University of Southern California with a PhD from Duke University. I'm going to have to say Duke University actually a few times here, so bear with me. Uh, we are going to talk about her first book, I think it is. A extraordinarily brilliant piece of scholarship that I enjoyed reading a lot. Dominican Crossroads. Crossroads. Let me do that a second time. Dominican Crossroads. H.C.C. Astwood and the Moral Politics of Religious Race Making in the Age of Emancipation. Where I guess the other tagline would be good diplomatic history. For all those Schaeferites who might listen and think it's all about the Cold War. So the title is, you said it a little bit wrong. Oh, uh, did I? Password in the Moral Politics of Race Making. I took out the religious. <laughs> ah, and I looked at your website instead of Duke University Presses. My bad. Oh, shoot. It's wrong on my website. Okay, I'll fix that. Yeah. Uh, well, there we go. We found him, found something that needs fixing. Um, all right, we'll do it. I will do it at the end again, too. And then we'll get it totally right. Um, came out October 24 with Duke University Press. Also a great place to publish if you're doing Latin American history and Caribbean history of any sort. So, but let's leave the introduction behind us, Christina, and let's get into your book because that's why we're here and what's so important how did you find Astwood? <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me on the show. This is really um, exciting for me to share the book finally. Um, so I was an undergraduate at Yale University uh, when I first went to the Dominican Republic in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the United States, uh, north side of Chicago. And um, there attended an African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now, the AME Church mm -hmm. is the first denomination, uh, Black denomination, incorporated here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was just a wonderful place to, you know, to form community, mm -hmm. learn about religion, you know, God, and um, feel really supported growing up. And of course, you know, there are AMEs actually now across the world, and there's an AME church in the Dominican Republic. So when I was going to do my research in, not my research, my study abroad in the DR, my mom says, let me call up the bishop, <laughs> right? Uh, let, let's, let's talk and like, you need to have some support down there. So I got connected with people mm -hmm. who are involved with the AME church in the Dominican Republic. Now... What I was learning at the time, uh, back in, I don't know, two, early 2000s, was that, you know, Dominicans don't really associate with anything Black, right? Um, and so that got me questioning, why is there an African Methodist Episcopal Church oh. in the DR? And that led me down a path to really understand uh, more of the history of African-American uh, connections to the island of Hispaniola. Um, which includes Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, and what I learned was that in the early 19th century, there was a mass immigration of people out of the United States, African-Americans, or at that time, um, enslaved and free Black folk, who are looking for a better place to live, obviously, because of slavery, escaping the U.S. And they go to Haiti. And at that time, Haiti is governing both sides of the island, um, east and west. And so the whole island is Haiti. Mm -hmm. And many of them land in what later becomes the Dominican Republic. So this is a long explanation to say that my research really started on trying to figure out uh, my religious history. How does oh. the AME church get down here? And through mm -hmm. studying that um, religious history, I come upon this character 
<laughs> this yeah, character is person. the right word choice. <laughs> yes, exactly. This historical person uh, named Henry Charles Clifford Astwood, who um, I later found out was the U.S. Counsel to the Dominican Republic in the 1880s. Excuse me. We have fire trucks going by. I don't hear them. Um, That's good. Oh, you don't hear them. That's wonderful. Okay. So it was a little distracting for me. So he was the U.S. counsel to the Dominican Republic in the 1880s. He's a person of African descent. And he was also at the same time an AME missionary mm -hmm. um, to the Dominican Republic. And so uh, that is how I found Astwood. It was through religious history and understanding the history of the African Methodist Episcopal Church that I landed upon his name. And then it wasn't until much later after publishing a dissertation and that I learned more about some of the things that he did in the Dominican Republic. Wow. That's that's one of the most fascinating ways of how to get to a subject I've had so far. I will, I will say that. No, that's crazy. And... So when you when you think of your book, do you think of it as sort of a biography or do you think of it more as like sort of a diplomatic history? What what kind of genre would you put it in um, mm -hmm. sort of first, second, third choice, I guess, since it's mm -hmm. tough to mail it down to one? Well, that's interesting that you would ask. And I I really love that you picked out that you can't quite nail it down to one because I think in some ways, that's part of the book, right? We can't mm -hmm. quite nail down yeah. Aswood as a person um, or, you know, the the nature of the crossroads, right, is that mm -hmm. you're at an intersection of, of many different things, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm arguing with the book. And I'm glad that it kind of comes out that there's also an intersection of various kinds of histories or, or fields of history. Um so I kind of don't want to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to go down the route of biography in part because when you when you when we think of like and you have a very centralized character with Aswood and it it their biographies where you kind of lose the focus on the character at times and you just don't lose the character if ever throughout. It's he's always there. But what you do mention is how hard it was to tell his story um, yeah. and the limits of, of of sources that are available about him. So I kind of was kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about that challenge of looking at like what a friend of mine calls sort of a B-list character when you when you want to write about some and see a big contribution, but it's really hard to kind of tell the whole life story. Yes, yes. I think, wow. Um, <laughs> so one of my greatest fears, but also a would-be greatest joy would be if um, there's this supposed source where he wrote a autobiography and published it in the Caribbean somewhere. <laughs> and so my greatest fear of a slash joy would be is if we could find that or, you know, if, if, all of a sudden, because asked what this book now exists, mm -hmm. people actually start finding more and more stuff on him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it it was challenging uh, because you know he is today kind of a B or a C <laughs> list mm -hmm. uh, historical figure, but at the time that he lived, you know he wasn't, or at least he mm -hmm. he himself was trying very hard not to be. He really wanted mm -hmm. to be A list, right? Yeah. So I I think that um, part of of trying to excavate his story is recognizing that the silences around him are, are quite purposeful, right? Because of some of the nefarious things that he did, uh, particularly in the Dominican Republic, you know, it, people didn't want that to come out. It looked bad for you know the race, quote unquote, right? Um, and so, um, and so. What I was able to do um, was get everything I could on him. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually started this book by writing chapter six, which is the book about or the the chapter on the Columbus Bones incident. Um, and you that right? chapter, <laughs> thank you. Yes, that chapter um, was fun to write. It was, it was mm -hmm. really fun, um, but it 
it was it was kind of a wild goose chase looking at newspapers right. and a lot of newspapers in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. um, and once I put that chapter together, I was like, oh, I really got to I have to know more. Right. I have to know more about his background. And so the first two chapters of the book are really setting up his background. Um, and, and those sources um, took me into a deep dive of Turks and Caicos sources, uh, really trying to you know, and there, there's not too much, right? There's, there's, I mean, on him specifically and his uh -huh. family, right? There's stuff I can trace in newspapers and genealogical records. Um, and then from there, really trying to fill out the background of what life was like for people in his, uh, of his skin color and in his class. Um, and so what I'm trying to do with those two chapters is not just tell his story, but really give the context that sets uh -huh. up the rest of the of the chapters, right? Like, even though he does all this nefarious things, I mean, the choices for him and other people like him were very limited. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to write a, if it if it was a biography, a biography that's that's like about the times, right? That uh -huh. gives and, and that gives a sense of how the context of slavery emancipation that wasn't quite emancipation mm -hmm. right, right yeah. um really can give rise to all kinds of reactions to the racist capitalist system that we have or mm -hmm. had in the past right um and so i think that that really does show a fuller extent of, of the humanity of people of african descent and so my my purpose in writing this biography if it's a biography <laughs> is to um to really, you know, give a sense of the context uh, that's going on with Astwood and, and use the sources to do that in the first part. In the later part, then I'm I'm able to look at episodes because that's what the sources allowed. Oh. Yeah, they, we'll get back to the Columbus chapter. That was like when you introduced the Columbus material early in the book and my, like, I'm not going to bring it up, but I, I put a note in there. I was like, what? <laughs> no that can't be right yeah and then i was really like that was an exciting chapter to read uh so that yeah but and i see asked what too is sort of really fascinating when you think of it's like he comes out of the british caribbean he lives in the spanish caribbean he goes into the french caribbean french Louis or u.s louisiana he has the united states in there it's like he's he seems to be everywhere mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, we should talk a little bit about him, right? Because yes. I don't know if listeners have read the book yet, right? So um, so let me start by saying that Astwood was a man of mixed ancestry, as far as I can tell. Uh, he was born in the Turks Islands on the very small Salt K Island, which is smaller than Grand K, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And um, and he lived there with his siblings. I think there were about 11 of them, right? Some of them have siblings. His father, as far as I can tell, was a salt proprietor, uh, a white man, um, and had a number of um, women of African descent as, um, as you know, sexual partners. But uh, Astwood's mother was, as far as I can tell, his primary um, partner, Um it's kind of weird to, you know, use the words of mistress or whatever, but that's, yeah. that's, that's the language I'll use. Right. Um, and this is, uh, he's born in 1844. So this is a moment post, uh, post emancipation for the British Caribbean. Um, however, he's surrounded by, you know, so much oppression all around him. Um, and from, this upbringing, um, he is recognized by his father. He joins his brother, his older brother, George Astwood in uh, trade, right? That's what the Salt Islands or the <laughs> Turks Islands is known for is salt trade. And so they're trading with all kinds of partners, right? Mm -hmm. From people from the U.S. South, uh, North, um, to the island of Hispaniola, right? So we have Haiti, Dominican Republic, St. Thomas, right? And um and so this is the world that he grows up in, one of trade, one of, of movement. And I think that, um, you know, while he is unusual, right, uh, in the in that he becomes U.S. counsel, he moves and he actually kind of 
we would say some somewhat of an upward mobility. Um, I don't think he's unusual in the sense of movement and migration, right? Mm -hmm. People of African descent, particularly in the Salt Islands, actually moved quite a bit between Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, places in the Dominican Republic in particular, Puerto Plata, Samana, right? And they go to um, other islands as they can, right? Of course, there's always the fear of capture at this point, right? Uh, Sail in Cuba, right? <laughs> places where there is still slavery. So you can't move too much, but but this oh. kind of, this the, the passage between Turks Islands and the Northern coast of Hispaniola is quite small. And Hispaniola itself is free soil, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so he does eventually make that trip. Um, it's in the 1860s after uh, the Dominican Republic has fought a war to regain their independence um, from Spain. And he lives in the Dominican Republic for a time with his wife. Um, and then um, after, you know, the project for U.S. annexation of the Dominican Republic fails in the 1870s, the early 1870s, he, and he moves to um New Orleans, right? And so and in New Orleans, right, we have this long history of uh, Haitian immigration, right? Um, but there's also a history of this time of immigration from the Spanish Caribbean, right? Uh, Antonio Manseo goes to New Orleans as well. <laughs> and so I think that there's, um, you know, he's he's right there with other Caribbean people, French speaking, Spanish speaking, and he's, you know, rubbing shoulders with all of these people, as well as with uh, African Americans during reconstruction, and uh, really trying to make a name for himself um, in, in politics and in religion. And that's how he then ends up um, in the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo in 1882. Yeah, and, and it's just... You you made it sound like so clean and easy, and when you read the book, it's everything but that. Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Yeah, his life was quite difficult, right? Yeah, but it's as, it's, as, it's when you when you kind of like when you talked about the salt trade and Puerto Plata and Santo Domingo and the or Santo Santiago and the north that when you look at the map, it's just such a close relationship that that mm -hmm. is there, and I I really enjoyed how you have like this constant back and forth, right? That's the Dominican revolutionaries that comes there and then the hurricane, you got to find new opportunities in the Dominican Republic. And it's just, it's it's sort of on a small scale, that movement of people that is just so common for this period. Uh, it, it just was, and how you could chronicle all of that movement and the activities and the, the the kind of relationships that then got built out of those constant movements. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it's interesting because, of course, the politics of the time also traces that. There's a lot of um, what I would say, uh, you know, concern, right, <laughs> from people in the British Caribbean, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, white people, the old master class of of these black men mm -hmm. who are military men uh, who are moving around, right? And I'm thinking in particular about, you know, Gregorio Luperon, right, who mm -hmm. is found in the Turks Islands a number of times as one of the bases for him and his men where they kind of brainstorm like how to get back to the DR and you know overthrow uh Baez who's the dictator there right but it's not just Turks Islands right this happens in Jamaica it happens in um St. Thomas as I've mentioned before so these uh you know whatever kind of society can mm -hmm. will um accept them and is also not a slave state of course then um these men are trying to gain allies and they do, which is part of, um, you know, this kind of era of thinking about an Antillean confederation, right? Um, uh, and this idea of an Antillean confederation, which is coming up during, you know, Cuba's 10 years war um, and, and war with, you know, in, in Puerto Rico, right? These movements for independence, the Dominican Republic and Haiti are part of this, right? And so, and, and Astwood finds himself right in the middle <laughs> of, of yeah. all of this. Yeah, and it's just this wonderful, like, it's these transnational networks that are existing everywhere during this period where revolutionaries all know each other, they kind of influence each other, they are supporting each other to a degree. It's, it's, uh, we, we sometimes forget how interconnected the world and the 
in those decades of the 19th century actually was. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. I think that's right. So let me then kind of try and think which direction I want to go with it because there's so much interesting stuff. And uh, actually, let me pick up where you kind of left off with your, with sort of the biography of, of him, sort of Louisiana, because he he obviously gets into Louisiana at a very interesting moment in time was it's sort of the end point of reconstruction. It's the kind of redemption, quote unquote, of the state that is starting there. And he's still very successful in garnering all these networks. So I'm going to let you respond to that first. And then, then I have the trouble problem with his <laughs> stay in Louisiana that I want to go to. Sure. Um, I found that to be really interesting, too. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, it reminds me of is just the ability to, even when everything is kind of <laughs> falling around you, yeah, building networks and building relationships, you know, the individual life might still yeah. kind of move forward in a yeah. way, which is, is, you know, weird language, I think, to use. Um, but he's really, you know, he's working it. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, <laughs> when you think of it, right, it's the end of reconstruction doesn't automatically mean everything goes from white to black or black to white, whichever way you want to think of it. It's, it's, it's grays that are starting to take over and then eventually it changes. But it really shows how I guess how much power African American networks and African American people at this late stage of Reconstruction, early stage of post Reconstruction, still had that they could lobby Washington and say, "Hey, is this guy would be good for an appointment somewhere?" Correct, and I I, I like your language of grace, right? Um, you know, it's. Uh, it's a place where people are still trying really hard, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to make to make this kind of dream of a racial democracy in the U.S. possible, or at least you know, public rights possible. Yeah. To use you know Rebecca Scott's term, um, and and it, you know, it's not quite clear um, that it's going to go the way that it went, <laughs> right? Right, and so he. He really, you know, he gets in good with PBS Pinchback. He's mm -hmm. uh, running newspapers. He's going to school, right? Learning mm -hmm. a little bit of the law um, and and really trying to figure out not just how to promote himself, right? But also, <laughs> you know, how to talk about politics within mm -hmm. the U.S. context. Um, and and within that, he he's drawing from his Caribbean background, mm -hmm. as many of these men do. Um, and so one of the things that I found to be really interesting is that it's under his editorial or editorship. How do you say editorship? this? Yeah. Editorship, right? Um, uh, that uh, with, with Pinchback's newspaper, that he's actually able to then translate some of uh, the words, you know, the articles into French. And so he's trying to make these connections between, mm -hmm. um, you know, English speaking African Americans mm -hmm. and Afro Creole class uh, and the Afro Creole class. And I think that that's, you know, really great because at, at this particular time, he's basically saying we need to combine forces mm -hmm. yeah. if we're going to get anything done. Um, and eventually, I think his his move out of Louisiana is, you know, I think precipitated by we need to, I need to get out of here. I need to get my family out of here because I'm going to be targeted. Um, you know, seeing people um, face just horrendous violence around him. Well, I guess there's also another reason why he was get, wanted to get out, which is the, I guess we can call it the first elephant in the book. <laughs> yeah, sure, we, sure. Why, kind of takes that euphemism of elephant in the room to another level. So he's married in the Dominican Republic. He comes That's to right. Louisiana and marries again. Mm -hmm. And I thought the most interesting part in that, I mean, A, marrying twice, I mean, that, that mentally would need a little explaining, but uh, we can't really explain that probably. 
But what I found fascinating was that the Douglases actually find out about this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it seems like people in Louisiana didn't really mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of hush hush, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is interesting in my, you know, so because this is a world of men, right? For one. Yeah. Right. And so you have kind of a, a maybe like a gentleman's, you know, kind of uh, agreement that I won't air okay. my dirt or your dirt if you don't air mine. This is what I'm surmising. Right. Mm -hmm. So so and if we go down the thought process. Right. So he's married to a Dominican woman. The marriage mm -hmm. actually takes place in the Turks Islands. Mm -hmm. Um, the first person, you know, who finds this out and brings it to the attention of uh, Astwood's associates in New Orleans is Charles Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglas. And the reason why Charles Douglas knows this is because um, during Reconstruction, Charles Douglas is appointed counsel to Puerto Plata mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic. Um, and... You know, he's there for a short period of time, but it's just long enough for him to meet um, Astwood's first wife, Margarita, who he claims is um, living in poverty with their, he says mm -hmm. four children, but the, as far as I can tell, they only had three children together. Right. Um, and, you know, she doesn't know what happened to Henry. Right. Um, he left on a boat and never to return. And that's the the story that we're getting from these letters from Charles Douglas. And so he takes it upon himself to to find the man, right? Mm -hmm. And because um, Astwood is somewhat of an unusual name, he's reading papers from New Orleans and he sees his name pick up, you know, there, HCC Astwood. And so he writes um, to Pinchback and says, you know, what... <laughs> this man is is married and now I see that he's also married um, in New Orleans. Now from Astwood's perspective, we don't really know what happened between him and Margarita, right. but I might surmise that it would be difficult to find, to, to get a divorce, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Spanish, clearly, Catholic, right? Right, to a yeah. Catholic woman, right? Yeah. Um, and so you know, to give him the benefit of the doubt, I, you know, in reading other sources, he's not the only man <laughs> that I found that is, that has done something like this, right? Okay. Um, back in, back in the day. And so um, it definitely was something that kind of shows uh, what I would, people would think around him as his moral character, right? A little mm -hmm. elephant in the yeah. room, a little hint yeah. that, you know, maybe, this man is not of the highest, you know, moral caliber as Charles Douglas, um, you know, accuses. Right. Um, however, I, as a historian, I want to be careful here, right? Like <laughs> judging the past because mm -hmm. we we actually don't know, right? Why yeah. he does, this. Um, you know, from the outside looking in, it looks like he's trying to get in good with the Afro Creole class, and so mm -hmm. he finds himself a young woman uh, named Alice. Um, who's a, apparently right he's accused of seducing um and then they have their first child before they're married uh, that child doesn't survive and uh they are eventually married but he and alice stay together for the rest of, of their his life right their lives so um, she becomes his um legitimate wife right in the eyes of the world and margarita you know we don't really hear much about or of of her again, and he does when he goes back to the Dominican Republic, um, take his three children with Margarita, and Alice raises them. You know to the extent that, you know they're they're a little bit older now, right? But um, yeah, so so it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting history one family history one I wish I could delve into a little bit more, but the sources don't allow. Yeah, that's always a problem, right? And like. Families break apart sometimes, and that could very well be the situation, but that would be a judgment we can't back up. So, right. oh, yeah, that was just, that was a fascinating, fascinating situation to see there with him. So now that he's in with the crowd in, in Louisiana, he has some powerful supporters. Let's, let's, 
before we send him back to the Dominican Republic as consul, also think about for a minute about the situation we're in, because you're you're writing about a period in sort of diplomatic history that is extremely scarce. There's not a lot written, right? It's sort of like a, 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 a turned around and went to the books with regard to post recon even reconstruction to 1900 diplomacy it's there's not much right you have like new empire la fever and beisner's new diplomacy old diplomacy to new diplomacy so it's all this it's all this setting up for the eventually emergence of the us empire and the war with spain in 1898 so and there are parts of your stories that seem to confirm that's sort of what us diplomacy is doing it's it is sort of looking towards empire mm -hmm. um we in the dominican republic's bases in the caribbean sort of it adds to that sort of narrative right where the united states wants some permanent location that it calls or eventually sort of protects the canal so so how do you feel with regard to astwood your book what do you do you feel like you're kind of confirming some of these old narratives or do you feel like there's something um news that you're adding that diplomatic history has not really kind of tackled strongly enough? Well, um, that's a big one. I know. <laughs> I think that the overarching move towards empire is one that is a story that cannot be denied if mm. we're looking at the Dominican Republic. Mm. And in fact, the Dominican Republic and Haiti are the places, right, that in this <clears throat> earlier, you know, earlier than official do dollar diplomacy, we are really seeing all of this stuff happening there prior, right? And so, <clears throat> yes, the book, you know, confirms, you know, that, that kind of overarching story. Mm. However, asked what is a person of African descent, right? So one of the things that I'm trying to do with diplomatic history is talk about this period in which African-American men are appointed to diplomatic posts abroad, right? Um, and this becomes less and less the case as we move into the early 20th century, but uh, beginning in, uh, in Reconstruction, right, with Ebenezer Bassett, right, we have, and during the U.S. Civil War, right, we have a recognition of Haiti um, that comes in 1862, right, a diplomatic recognition for the from the U.S. for the first time in Haitian history, and and then we have a later appointment um, of an African American, uh, the first U.S. ambassador or minister, as they were called at that time to Haiti. And as what actually comes much later, right? They don't appoint black men to the Dominican Republic until Astwood, which is in 1882, right? So I guess we can consider this like a post reconstruction period or a long reconstruction period, depending yeah. on how you think about that. Um, and so one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about is like, this becomes kind of a, the last frontier, right? Mm -hmm. For, for African-Americans, uh, male men to kind of live out this idea of political authority, right? Participation in in the state, and they do so through through empire. And so, one of the things I'm I'm thinking through is, you know, what does it mean that he is a black man, right? That that he is of African descent. Um, how can we think about racial capitalism, okay. right? With that, and 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 how do we think about uh, diplomatic history, if we're doing it from a cultural lens, if we're thinking about religion in tandem with that, or the ways in which he's kind of playing ideas of morality within transnational space. And so I think that's kind of what I'm at, adding to the discussion here, um, while still kind of keeping that overarching history in mind, you know, some of the particulars of, uh, you know, well, this is a little, it's a little different, right? Like, this is not a, a white man doing this stuff it's it's a person of african descent and what does he get out of it <laughs> right what what does he think he's doing in this space yeah no I, I, exactly right that's sort of an important 
important conversation to have that there's more than just the interactions between state leaders that are making up a diplomatic interaction during this period. But you also kind of add an important reminder that I, I do want to talk about briefly as well, is that he, he is very ambitious. He wants to be a minister to the Dominican Republic, not just a consul. So he wants that upgrade in some form to a higher status. And mm -hmm. But at the same time, and it, it shines through in a couple of your chapters, he doesn't seem to be taken very serious by his superiors <laughs> in Washington. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's like, yes, we're giving these appointments to African men, but we're not really listening to what they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. And he does all kinds of, you know, he uses all kinds of tactics to get mm -hmm. his way. And I think the, I the strategy, <laughs> right. Um, what I call, you know, state grift, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that is, uh, you know, as opposed to state craft, it, it is his his craft, right? And one of the things that I, I trouble particularly, I think in chapter three, is, you know, we 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 call it state craft when, you know, it's the people at the top, right? The white men in power. But when we look at somebody like Astwood, all of a sudden it becomes grift, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I I, I want to tackle that dichotomy um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of say, no, all of it was grift <laughs> on some level, right? Um, and and they don't take him very seriously. I think because you know he's a person of African descent in a country that the U.S. considers to be a black nation. Mm -hmm. And at this particular point in time, one of the interventions of the book is that in 1883, uh, is that I say that in 1883 the U.S. changes its diplomatic designation of the DR and puts it actually under the jurisdiction of the ministry, the, the U.S. ministry in Port-au-Prince. And so from a Dominican perspective, Dominican politicians are looking at this and they're like, does the U.S. think we're beneath, you know, Haiti, right. the nation from which we gained our independence, you know, and with everything that Haiti means in, in racist, you know, Creole <laughs> kind of uh, Dominican, you know, history, um, this is a great insult, right? And so Astwood's vying for the position of U.S. minister and upgrade of his post from council to minister is really asking the United States government to deal with the Dominican Republic on its own terms. Mm -hmm. Now, in this point in time, in 1883, we also have Ulysses Arroyo, who is a man of Haitian descent, um, a general, a Dominican man of Haitian descent and a general in the Dominican army who then rises to power and becomes the president of the nation. And he's a dark skinned man. And so um, the U.S. is not going to, you know, they don't want to have to deal with two black republics. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, but at the same time, Astwood is trying to get them to do so. And so I do think that there is a, a larger project um for, you know, recognizing political authority for these Black men, these men like Uro, men like Astwood, that he is trying to to get at. Um, and he's doing so in, in, in ways that, you know, I think run counter to a liberatory, you know, liberation to, towards Black liberation. No, that's, it must feel really, really disappointing from the Dominican perspective, right? You fought in 1844, I think it was, to gain independence from Haiti. And then you get 40 years later told by the United States, oh yeah, you're equal to them, you're below them. It, it is insulting, um, especially considering what, 20 years or not even 20 years ago, you regained your independence a second time from Spain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's from a national honor perspective, totally understandable that they would not be happy about that. Um, right. And have a good advocate in, in Aspwood, I suppose. Yes, I think so. I think so, because it's a win-win for him. Right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, um, so yeah. we, have, uh, we have two, I would say, two great episodes with, with Aspwood that you kind of talk about in the book. And the first one is 
And I'm not sure how I want to define it, so I'm probably gonna just leave it to you. The I'm gonna say I'm gonna call it the death of John Platt, and you can complicate it as you like. But you devoted a whole chapter to Platt, his his death, and Asworth's work to get money compensating his widow. Mm -hmm. So what happened? <laughs> Right. So um, as I start <laughs> right in this chapter, um, there a lot of mystery <laughs> was in that chapter at the start. It was yes. great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a mysterious night, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what's perspective. The chapter opens. He's walking home from church. They must have had some kind of it's a Wednesday mm -hmm. night. So, you know, some sort of I don't Bible know, study, crazy. I guess. Bible yeah. study, something. right and he's walking home with his wife Alice <laughs> and all of a sudden he sees all of these soldiers running past him right um headed towards the hotel the hotel Mercedes and um well it's the hotel San Pedro on Mercedes Street and so he goes back home and they they're like oh that was weird right and and a few hours later Um, he gets a large knock on the door. It's very loud. He wakes up and he hears uh, from uh, a, a, a French man who's uh, who's at the hotel, who I suppose he must have known, um, you know, just, you know, being a diplomat and all of that, that um, a citizen, a U.S. citizen, John J. Platt, has been killed. and has been killed by the Dominican government. And so Astwood makes haste, he dresses, he gets over to the hotel, and this whole kind of investigation unfolds as to how could this have happened. Now, I talk about this death being um, mentioned in Dominican records, <laughs> and it's mentioned alongside um, the story of Cesario Guillermo, who was a, you know, Dominican general, right, um, who's also uh, vying for power um, against um, uh, the liberals. So so we can think about like liberals and conservatives in Dominican history. And Guillermo is a man who's recorded of being of African descent, although he's mm -hmm. quite light skinned as far as we can tell. Um, and he is a uh, a conservative and a role, even though he becomes a dictator, <laughs> um, is, is considered to be liberal. So it's kind of a Rose government. Um, and at this particular point, it's actually not a role who's in power, but his really good, uh, uh, his colleague, uh, Alejandro Rossigil. And so um, anyway, I'm getting into the weeds. <laughs> the point of this is that this death is accidental. right? Mm -hmm. This killing is accidental. And the bullets were actually meant uh, from the liberal government to hit Cesario Guillermo, the conservative. And so Astwood finds himself uh, in the middle of Dominican politics, liberals versus mm -hmm. conservatives. What will the future of this nation be? Will we be going? This is like the rise of a rose dictatorship, which, hmm. you know, comes right after this, on the heels of this. And Cesario is one of his, Cesario Guillermo is one of his enemies. But John J. Platt gets killed in the middle of this. And Astwood uses this moment, uses this death of a white man to really ask the U.S. government to get involved in the Dominican Republic. We need, we need an indemnity, he says, for the widow. And we need a robust American presence here and you need to pay attention to me <laughs> because I'm the person who can negotiate this and I'm in good with Iro, right? Um, right. And Wasigil's government. And so this is one of those uh, moments that uh, one of the episodes that I talked about earlier um, that I really delve in and look at the ways in which he uses um, his dispatches back to the US to construct a picture Um, and to really kind of play various sectors of both Dominican society and U.S. government against each other um, in order to get what he ultimately wants, which is the political power to have his way and to have, you know, the way of, of Ulysses Aro in the Dominican Republic. This is his space and he's going to make it happen. And the ways he goes about this is by raising up uh, racist and uh, gender tropes about Black men. 
Um, and this comes very, very clearly in the source documentation that he sends back to uh, the Dominican, uh, to the United States. And he also uses very racist language mm -hmm. to paint the Dominican Republic at this time as akin to revolutionary Haiti, right? And the U.S. has all these stereotypes, this long history of, mm -hmm. of, of racist tropes of Haiti itself. But the DR asked what says is your worst nightmare. <laughs> it is Haiti, <laughs> right? Um, these Black men are rising up. And so um, that that is what this chapter is about. And then it explores how um, in the Dominican Republic, the idea of Black political authority also is contested uh, around uh, a rogue rising to power. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's 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 just the kind of internal politics are just fascinating. Of these two rivals that are just right, literally one of them willing to kill the other to make sure that the rise to power is guaranteed. <laughs> it's like um, mm -hmm. it's. You can kind of see like the, the newspaper articles in the U.S. writing themselves in in that right from like the right. racist because, press because all of this right it plays into the racist tropes of you know um, unruly black men right yeah. misrule black misrule yeah. right um, like they're not able to govern themselves right when in reality what is happening is people actually have political projects mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and ideas yeah. for their nation. And they fight over it, just like we do here in the U.S., right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, you know, I think that this chapter, what I'm trying to do is recognize that. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, recognize how racist, moralized language mm -hmm. um, is the is the currency of power here, right? It's like, I'm going to throw you a trope this way or that way to, to really kind of make your way into uh make your way into into what is right mm -hmm. uh, and we see this happening all the time right today right in today's poli politics like we don't need to get into u.s politics too deeply no. <laughs> to see how you know racist and, and gender tropes um continue to exist yeah the next four years are going to be fun in that right exactly so. um, but <laughs> to avoid that here today um what what was really interesting too was sort of the um uh, sort of you you mentioned it already but this kind of playing for for his power plays right that he he basically is told from washington no 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 these negotiations should go through part of prince should go with a minister and he's like yeah whatever i'm just gonna do whatever i want and he's getting exactly. like I, I i lost track how many times he got reprimanded <laughs> by the authorities in Washington, by the State Department. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, and he just kept going, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, I just ignore you because I just want to do it. Right, and it's, you know, it's it's, it's funny on <laughs> some of yeah. his letters because he's like, oh, you must not have meant what you meant. <laughs> yeah, so, let me ignore what you just said. Yes, exactly. You couldn't have meant that because... If you really meant that, then we wouldn't get our way in San Domingo. And so I just went ahead and did what I wanted to do. <laughs> right? A paraphrase of some of his letters, right? Like, yeah. oh, no, you couldn't have meant for me to stop. <laughs> right? Or on the other hand, the zeal for which I have, you know, I, I the for which I fight for Americans down here has led me to continue the right. fight that you told me to stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And so... um. I think the audacity is one of the things, you know, from a, looking back, you, you kind of admire. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, you're kind but, of like, how did he not get fired sooner? Exactly, exactly. Like it, and I think because he gives them what he what they want, yeah. right, at the end of the day. Yeah. And yeah, we'll really get to... glad the wife of, of John J. Platt gets gets her indemnity. Right, yeah. And it's it's interesting. I don't want to get too far ahead because I do want to talk briefly about Columbus, but it's in part Platt's and indemnities that helps bring him down too eventually. So but before we get there, because I do want to talk about his fall from grace at least briefly at the end. Um Christopher Columbus, the chapter you wrote first, and that got me scratching my head all all the time on a flight. <laughs> so I had no, A, I had no idea. I told my wife earlier today when we were at a party, a uh, tire shop, the story of that. And 
she was like, I did not know that Columbus's bones were in the Dominican. And her question, I'm going to start with that, was, are they still there? <laughs> well, yes, actually. Um, so post Trujillo, the man who came to power, mm -hmm. uh, Joaquin Balaguer, uh, created actually a Columbus lighthouse, right? Yes, I and, do know that lighthouse. one. Right, right. And and there is where these remains that are purported to be of Christopher Columbus repose. But of course, this is contested, right? Because right. Uh, Spain would never acknowledge that. Right, right, exactly. And and but it continues to be contested today, right? Huh. Because you can go to Sevilla, Spain, right, and see Columbus's not his actual remains, but the tomb where his remains are held, right? Was it um, held? But well, actually, they. As far as I know, they've done DNA testing okay. on those for me, and they're yeah, so confirmed. What's... So there's a there's a couple explanations, right? One, Columbus might be in pieces <laughs> across the world, and so so there might actually be two two remains, or you know maybe the one in the DR are not his remains, but maybe they are, right? And and the Dominican Republic has not done DNA testing right. as far as I can tell with my research. And so therefore we we do not know. Um, oh my but, but, you know, I think what's more important here yes. is that as much as we do not know in 2024, they really didn't know in 1877 because there was no DNA testing. And in 1877, when... Uh, Columbus's remains were found. We're going to go with, yes, these are the true okay. remains, right? From okay. a, a Dominican nationalist stance. Um, this becomes, this kind of hits off a full fight because people believe actually that the remains of Columbus are in Cuba, right? Under Spanish mm -hmm. government. And so all of a sudden the Dominican Republic enters into a, an international, you know, controversy over whether Dominican Republic uh, this country supposedly run by black people, right, in the international yeah. purview, um, or Spain, a quote unquote white country, mm -hmm. owns the, this legacy, the, these remains, these relics right. of uh, the supposed discoverer of the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a big uh, fight um, that uh, that you know, other scholars have have really, you know, detailed in 1877, where my chapter comes in is um, about 10 years later, <laughs> right? A little bit more, where uh, people are gearing up for the quadricentennial of uh, Columbus's landing in the Americas. And, you know, this is going to be Big celebrations, right? As we know, right? It, the U.S. celebrates in Chicago with a World Fair, right? Dedicated to to Columbus, the Columbian World Fair. But there are other celebrations held uh, in in Spain and in other places in the Americas as well. And uh, the Dominican Republic, because they purport to hold these remains, uh, Astwood wants to give them the gift of uh, legitimizing, right? Having the U.S. government legitimize their claim to the remains. And the way that he sees to do this is uh, there's this man, Herbert Linnell, who comes. And it's actually Linnell's idea to how about we take these remains from Dominican soil and take them to the U.S. and we'll claim that they're Columbus because that's what we believe. And we're really going to legitimize this claim by parading them across the U.S. and let, uh, let the Americans gaze upon Columbus, right? Um, and this sets off an international controversy, another one, right? Over whether, uh, like, how could this be, right? This is a profane, um, you know, it's an insult to Columbus and to his memory, right? As the Dominican government claims. And so newspapers from, you know, all over the US to the Dominican Republic, to Puerto Rico, to even Panama um, are talking about uh, the Barnum Council, as some of them call him, right? um, with reference to Phineas Barnum, right, uh, the, the the show master, right? yeah. trying to parade Columbus across. And so I talk about the moral politics okay. of what it means for Columbus to be paraded about when we know simultaneously people of African descent, Africans, in fact, are being paraded about in places none other than the Chicago World's Fair. <laughs> so, 
Um, and so that dichotomy is one that is highly racialized. Mm -hmm. And I, I purport, well, why not? <laughs> Right. You know, and if we if we start to ask the question, why why not? Why is this ludicrous? Why is it funny? <laughs> right? Then we can start picking apart, you know, the world that makes uh -huh. it okay for black people to be sold and to be, you know, millions of them sold mm -hmm. for centuries. Um, but the one person who can't be sold or paraded about is then Columbus, Christopher Columbus, um, and his remains, no less. And so I, I think that this is uh, an interesting question, um, and I and I track how Aswood actually gets in quite a bit of trouble, <laughs> um, both in the U.S. and in the Dominican Republic for this proposal. Now, let me let me put it ask this one because you very clearly and both in the book and here said that it really wasn't his idea. He just sort of negotiated for for the guy but he gets he gets the blame for it right. was it because he's like he's not easy picking i mean it's not the low-hanging fruit here that you could go for he's is it because people see this as sort of like an axe that they can that they have been grinding and now it's a chance to go after him or is it that he's just convenient in this moment to go after? I think there are probably two explanations here. The first is that once Astwood sends the proposal, it actually becomes official state business. And Ouch. so and so he is the person, <laughs> right, who's mm. going to take the blame. Um, and potentially, the second explanation is that is what the Dominican government was hoping for. Because if you want to get somebody out of office and want him to take a blame for something and you don't want him in the DR anymore, how about you whisper to him, hey, it would be a great idea. We'd be really happy to have these bones like leave the, the state and you can parade them around and then we can get, you know, like maybe mm -hmm. this idea originated with the DR, the government. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, set him up, yeah. Set him up and then he takes the blame. And- I don't know if this is the case. However, mm. Astwood does say in a number of his dispatches that I checked this with the guys. And mm. then they made a big deal out of it after I actually sent the state the official request. <laughs> right? Mm. Like I checked before I even sent this off yeah. that they would support this. Um, and the other thing that, you know, kind of hints that maybe it was the case is that Ulisi Zero himself later down the line proposes this to um, Frederick Ober, who is the person who goes to the DR to kind of collect relics for, hmm. for the fair. And so, you know, this is not a strange idea, <laughs> but it is one that gets him in a lot of, a lot of trouble. And it is in that very moment too, that we see like what, I guess we can call this fall from grace, right? That there's, I guess we could, I, let me put it this way. Do you see more like factors that it was sort of his fault that he had overstepped one too many times? Or was it factors where it's like, it, it seemed from the books that there were a lot of people that felt he hadn't done his job properly for their cases. Um, mm -hmm. for their business interests. And that was a driving force in bringing him down. Um, well, the driving force of capitalism is that somebody has to lose. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, totally. You can't, right. have, you can't have winners all around. And this is the problem for Astwood is because he is juggling so many different interest mm -hmm. groups. He's juggling U.S. businessmen mm -hmm. Um, who are investing in the Dominican Republic. He's juggling the Dominican government, in particular, mm -hmm. Ulises Eero, who want to see certain things happen for their country. And when it comes to Eero, he wants to guarantee that there's, you know, money coming into his treasury, which then goes into his pocket as well. He's, um, you know, 
within the Dominican government, it's not just the guys at the top. You have all kinds of officials at the bottom. You have the Dominican court system as well. He also has U.S. officials in Washington. He has the the guys in Port-au-Prince <laughs> that he has to report to. Supposed um, to, I suppose. Supposed to, supposed to. Um, and so he, you know, one one thing that he does is he he barters in information, right? Uh -huh. He knows things that other people don't doesn't, and he hides things. And this uh, uh -huh. gives him time to concoct his stories as he would right. see fit, as he believes will benefit him. Uh -huh. um, but at some point, he runs out of time and he runs out of money uh -huh. um, to keep everybody happy. And you know, I think that 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 is what leads to his downfall. And in particular, at this. At this time in Dominican history, from the 1870s all the way through the, the first decades of the 20th century, you have this revving up of the sugarcane industry. Mm -hmm. And it is um, right around the 18, well, 1884, there's this large crack in the sugar market. So all the prices drop, uh, people are losing money, and they really want to, they want relief from the Dominican government on taxes, right? And Astwood is one of the persons that I surmise, like, doesn't quite get them the relief that they need or want. Mm -hmm. And they want this through um, a reciprocity treaty with the US and that never comes into fruition. And I and I trace that pretty closely mm -hmm. in, in chapter three of the book and then it comes back up in chapter four. And it's kind of in the, in the background that there are some economic forces and particularly the sugar industry that he gets on the bad side of the people who for so long will loom over Dominican politics. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's really through sugar that the U.S., you know, holds and welds eventually a lot of power in the, in the DR it's through this kind of, I guess, sugar cartel. Right. Like you might say, right. The oligarchs. Um, yeah. And so and so he um, he crosses one too many people and people with power. And I think that they they kind of band together to figure out how to get him out of office. Well, yeah. And you have that that. I hate to say it, but it's sort of it's it's sort of a triumvirate of three guys that are just making every effort to get him out and then keep him out too. It's it's like it's what did he say? Like it was volumes of letters that they send to kind of convince the Cleveland administration and the Senate, like, no, this man is not good politics to say it. Right. And so so that's the last chapter, chapter seven. And so one might think, right, that this Columbus Bones deal that didn't go through is right. what gets him out of office. And it does it is what gets him fired officially. Mm -hmm. However, he doesn't he go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So he stays in office. Yeah. Um plays a stance in there. <laughs> yes, he, he kind of plants his his flag and he's not yeah. leaving, right? Um and and eventually he is made to leave. Uh, so that happens in 1888, in December of 1888, he, his dismissal is sent, his official dismissal, but he doesn't leave. But by the spring of 1889, he, he does actually have to leave and he goes back to the United States and he vies for his same position, for an appointment back to Santo Domingo. And it's not exactly clear whether he'll win or not. I mean, you might think like, of course he's out, but no, actually there's, he might actually go back, right? Mm -hmm. And so this, the story of his downfall is one in which um, we think about, I, I take letters of recommendation that are written for and against him. And I look at mm -hmm. them as a genre in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I try to really think about and dissect, you know, the, the, moral and racial politics of these letters. And mm -hmm. while he has, you know, dozens of people writing in support of him. So the letters that are pro Astwood are way outnumber <laughs> the letters mm -hmm. that are negative. The ones that are negative are particularly poignant, right? They're, and they are these three guys, um, including um, John Wanamaker, who's the postmaster general of the US at the time. And so I think, you know, he, in, in also, um, uh, Clyde um, uh, of uh, who who runs the um, the steamship companies around the island of Hispaniola, right? And so um, I those between those two people, and and then there's one other guy in there, oh, wow. uh, 
yes, Cunningham, who uh, those those three together, they really get him out of office and get and get the guy that they want in uh, John Astor. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, it shows what like, right, what U.S. diplomacy during this period was for when it was down to a consul. You have to represent and enhance U.S. commercial interest if you can't do it. You got to go. But, yeah. However, right, U.S. commercial interests. Well, this is interesting, right, because uh, Clyde actually has this whole run in with Frederick Douglass. Right. And this is the accusation that's lodged against Douglas to get Douglas, um, mm -hmm. who serves as U.S. minister to Haiti right in 1889 1890 to get him out of office right okay. and so um and so i i want to you know maybe question that just a little mm -hmm. bit right because of course this is an easy excuse like well if you can't do the job right go right yeah. um but these are lots of extracting extracting wealth for the particular people who tell them to extract wealth at the time that they tell them to extract it extract it right from uh haiti and dominican republic and so basically what these uh, these um businessmen are saying is you know if you can't get me my money by the time i need it <laughs> then you got to get out and i'm going to get you out of office um and and that's what they do um and Total gilded you know, age exactly yeah. exactly it, and so um and so you know i talk around the the racialized moral politics around that in that last chapter uh, eventually asked what is he's outed um, yeah. he yeah. still doesn't like the dr quite yet <laughs> <laughs> but but that's for another chapter i suppose the, the one yeah. that they made me take out the book so. <laughs> oh yeah. next volume yeah next volume exactly um so, no, it, so the, it's, and yeah, I talked a little bit about, you know, what happens to him after, after the fact. Mm, that's, that must be fascinating too, of kind of like the picking up the pieces. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's also fascinating when you think of considering how many thousands, right? Thousands of African-American native born men were available for consulship. It is a foreign-born African American man or Afro Caribbean mm. man who gets this job. It, it's it's really interesting how fluid on some levels the citizenship um, mm. boundaries still are during this period. Yes, and to be clear, his citizenship is actually contested by Charles R. Douglas. It's not just his supposed bigamy, but also his citizenship that mm. Charles Charles R. Douglas says. Well, he's not even a true U.S. citizenship, even yeah. though he does have naturalization papers, but he's not in the U.S. the requisite, I think, five years that it, it's required oh, at that true. time to 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 apply for them. So, you know, some sort of he has the nat. I have, you know, I had the record, but, you know, it's yeah. he hasn't been there supposedly long enough. And um, it's either Frederick or. Douglas or Charles, who says this is not the sort of man that we want representing mm -hmm. the United States and also the race, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's weird because, you know, he is foreign born. Um, so I'm sure that, you know, people who were born here, are, they feel slighted. Um, however, it's not unusual. Uh, councils across the U.S. diplomatic corps at this time are often, you know, if they're not um, you know, foreign diplomats, because sometimes, you know, oh, the French council would also serve as the U.S. the minister, the U.S. council, right? <laughs> then sometimes they're, they're people who are American expats, or they're native to the country where they are, uh, because the consulship is, is not, it's not a ministry. <laughs> it's, it's not the ambassador. It's, you know, it's, a, it's U.S. commercial relations. And you, you know, it's, it's one of those, positions that you know asked what aspired to however he and others around him at the time realized that this is you know a kind of a backwater position that's a interesting punchline to end on 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess we, we are coming to the end and yes. uh, I that just was... want to say thank you so much for having me on, uh, you know, maybe I oh. would like to end on a, on a different punchline. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Go for it before um, I do my closing line. Yeah. And... Sure. I mean, I, you know, I don't want him to be seen as this backwater person who can just be put away neatly. No, he's I not. That that's, right. that's what history has done so far. I want mm -hmm. to trouble the borderlands, you know, trouble kind of this, the shadows, what lays in the shadows mm -hmm. and really look at it, even if it's, you know, not so nice, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, even if yeah. he does work against Black liberation, I, I would say at times, right? Mm -hmm. Because these are the stories that I think are important uh, to tell um, and to bring to the foreforge bring to the fore just as I think Dominican history itself is important to bring to the fore it's not always um the history that one goes to when we think about the Caribbean and U.S. relations right Haiti Cuba are, these are places that are much more discussed and discussed too in terms of black internationalist politics but I think looking at the Dominican Republic um allows us to see people like asked what allows us to think about the AMA church it allows us to think about um black empire you know black u.s empire in ways that sometimes are is uncomfortable and i i really think that you know some of the moral politics that he uses um the ways that he's able to manipulate um various information as well as you know people is an important part of the story um and so i think we should end there i think we should end with astwood uh being a problematic figure but one mm -hmm. that really reflected his times and the the limited choices that black men who who vied for political power had before them and he you know he did the best that he could or you know he he was trying mm -hmm. and i think that 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 should be part of the story as well no, I, I totally agree. I, I, I as I said earlier, it's a really fascinating book in in kind of the, the depths of the Dominican Republic history that you bring into it. So you kind of digging up that whole story of his like engaging in overlooked aspect of US history during this like the late nineteenth century foreign relations. Um and bringing together like foreign relations, African American history, like religious history trade history it's like it's it's incredible all the all the different strains that you're able to combine in the books there so it was a great pleasure to read that and i appreciate that you took the time today to chat with us <clears throat> thank you so much for having me on thank you for reading the book and um yeah i hope others will read it and and you know um contact me because yeah. it's it's fascinating to talk about <laughs> oh so, yes uh, certainly a, a, true, a true pleasure yes thank you yeah and if you're interested in the book now it's dominican crossroads and i'm gonna get it from the duke press website now the right title hcc astwood and some moral politics of race making in the age of emancipation um very very fascinating book worse worse getting from duke university press um and again, Christina, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really a pleasure.